Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody had a nice lunch. It's a pleasure to be here. We should thank the organizers for bringing me all the way from Brazil to share some of our uh, experience. Thank you. With uh, risk management applied to cultural heritage, I uh, will share with you some of uh, my recent uh, experience in applying this methodology, specifically on how we are modeling and communicate loss of value applied to cultural heritage within the risk management methodology. I would like to start with a quote, and that reads from a compendium of uh, experts in quantitative risk analysis in uh, different fields. And this says, for a risk analysis to help the manager to determine which options are to be preferred. And that applies also to cultural heritage when we manage heritage assets. A clear question should be stated in terms of a quantitative estimate. Right, so this kind of requirement. Let me show you some examples. People working in uh, environmental field, ecosystems. So if they want to assess the risks of climate change, for instance, in uh, uh, marine ecosystems, one of the quantitative indicators they've used when they do risk analysis is what's the potentially disappeared fraction of species in that ecosystem. That's a quantitative indicator. So the risk analysis, risk assessment, aims at answering that kind of question or quantifying this indicator. Another one in the health field, another quantitative indicator, for instance, the number of disease cases. We just saw recently with the Ebola virus, I saw this morning on TV that the UN is worried that we can have a big spread of the virus in the world. So how many cases? People are working on this kind of risk assessment, right, in the, in the health sector. Or another indicator is expected years of life loss due to a new disease. So epidemiology uses a lot of that. If you are in, in the market, so financial business, right? Basic indicators are what, what's going to be our likely profits or losses. Countries today, they have a risk indicator so, so that foreign investors, they can say, I'll put my money in Mexico, Brazil is too risky at the moment. So this is a quantitative indicator, right? So it's used uh, systematically in different fields. And then we want to ask ourselves, how about cultural heritage? Right? If you want to apply risk assessment to cultural heritage, where we have hazards and risks and things such as theft or fire, or, or landslides, floods, pest damage, chemical damage, biodeterioration. So what's the suitable quantitative indicate that we should use when we analyze risks to cultural heritage? taking into account that there's a range of different types of losses and damage, right? And I think Agnes already has mentioned that. For us working with, uh, with risk management in the field, the quantitative estimate we use is the expected, so what we expect in the future, expected frac fractional loss of value in the heritage asset. So this is what we aim for when we assess risk to cultural heritage assets, be it an object, a museum collection, a building, a country's heritage. So what's the expected fractional loss of value in that asset in the future, within 10 years, within 100 years, and so forth? So this is one main point. So we, we work with this uh, indicator. And to model this loss of value in the methodology we are working with so far, which is a result of this collaboration between ICROM, the Canadian Conservation Institute, and the Netherlands Agents for Cultural Heritage. We model risk, uh, loss of value in risk uh, analysis. We use two components to model that. First component is to understand for a certain risk, what's the fraction of the overall value of the heritage asset affected by the risk which parts, which components of the heritage asset are affected, and how much do they represent of the overall value of that uh, heritage asset. I'll show an example in a little bit. 
Second component of the model is out of these affected components of the heritage uh, asset, what's the fractional loss of value expected in each one of them? In other words, when we are trying to assess a certain risk, we ask ourselves how much of this collection will be affected by the risk, or how much of these heritage buildings, how many of them will be affected by the risks. And out of these items affected, how much value are they going to lose? And this is all fractional. When we say fractional, it's like today they have a certain value, and if this uh, risk occurs, they will lose a fraction of that can be total, can be tiny, so we quantify that. The focus of today's talk is on the first component, right? The second one is, uh, just let me just go back. We use a uh, weighted average to estimate the fractional loss of value if you are talking about many components. So some of them can suffer large loss, others can suffer smaller loss. If you picture an earthquake in a museum, some objects will be heavily damaged, Others will be mildly damaged, and others will suffer just uh, little damage. So we, we carry out a weighted average to get this fractional loss. And to uh, judge the loss of value, expected loss of value, we do a calibrated estimates. So we go through a calibration exercise uh, linking degree of damage with fractional loss of value. But this is, will be a topic for another long talk. The focus of today is here. So how do we uh, model the fraction, the part of the heritage asset that is affected by the risk and how much does this part represent of the total value? So that's the main focus of today. When I say heritage asset here, it can be a museum collection, a set of buildings, an archive, so it has to be defined. It can be a national heritage, right? Just let me give you one example. I was uh, last week in Ecuador, and there they are running, I'm running together with the National Institute for Heritage, a uh, national level project to assess risk to movable cultural heritage in the country. So it's the heritage asset are all movable heritage items. We are running a pilot study in the northern part, right? And for instance, when we looked at the risk of tsunami damage to that population of heritage assets. In a total of 121 institutions between museums, churches, and historic buildings located in the, the area where the pilot studies was run, only seven of them are exposed to the tsunami hazards, which are those located here on the coast. This is a hazard map of tsunami for Ecuador, right? So in terms of numbers, the fraction of this heritage asset exposed to the hazard is 7 in 121, right? But then we need to ask ourselves, how important are, are these seven? Are they the national treasures? Or are they just average heritage institutions? Are they very important or in between? So how much do these seven represent out of the total value of that population? Right? So we are moving away from just a fraction in terms of numbers. We want to understand how important these items that are affected by the risk are in relation to the total. Right? This is another extreme example I like to use to illustrate that on the movable heritage side. Big museum, lots of uh, uh, precious and important paintings by different masters on the wall, nobody's looking at them. There's a treasure there, right? So it's painting, painting, painting. In terms of numbers, they count the same. But in terms of value, and at this moment in the Louvre, Mona Lisa is one of the treasures. And every collection I've seen, be it buildings, be it archives, they have their Mona Lisas. And you can see how much it is protected. Right? There must be a reason for that. So that's what, what we mean by we just don't want to understand which part, how many items are affected, but how important they are. Okay? So this is just a simple model of a heritage asset, collection, sets of buildings, where we have treasures, average 
items and then between, in between, it can be more uh, levels. Just to say, risks that affect the entire collection. So for this kind of risk that damage everything, like large fires affecting a museum. So this kind of uh, value categories are of, of secondary importance. But many risks, just like the tsunami I mentioned in Ecuador, they are localized. So they can affect the same risk, average value items, and the same kind of phenomena, they can also affect the treasures, the Mona Lisa against the other painting. And when we talk about the impact of the risk, and Agnes was mentioning probability and impact, loss of value, if the same kind of phenomenon occurs affecting the treasures and the high value components, the loss of value to the institution will be much higher here than here, right? Many risks they have, they are, they are localized. So we want to understand which part of the collection of the a asset and how much value do they represent. We want to understand how, which part is going to be affected. So understanding and communicating how this overall value of a given heritage asset is distributed among its components is crucial. It's essential to model risks the way we are doing when we want to assess what's the fractional, expected fractional loss of value. We have to, need to have an idea about how this value is distributed, right? So I'm going to go through one example just to show you how we are dealing with that right now, taking into account all the subjective aspects of evaluation, etc. But we need, we need a quantitative estimate, right? So how to do it? I'll show you an example we did the last year at the House of Representatives in Brazil. So the step-by-step, -step, the way we did that. First of all, define the heritage asset we are working with. Is it the building and the contents? Which contents? Or are we going to do uh, the entire municipality set of historic buildings, or like Ecuador? the national movable heritage. So we have to have it very clear what's the scope of, of this value assessment. Once that is uh, done, so we need to define the, I called here, what are the, the relevant components? How is this heritage asset divided? Existing components to be included in the value assessment. So it's, we start with broader components, I'll show example. And then, as necessary, we subdivide. So start simple, and as it becomes necessary, we subdivide this heritage asset into subcomponents. Use already existing value or curatorial categories, if applicable. Some institutions, many institutions, they have categories. For instance, at the House of Representatives, they had already this kind of uh, components of the heritage asset. They have the administrative archives, audiovisual archives, historic archives, legislative archives. They have what they call the integrated elements of the building, which is like furniture, carpets, stained glass, decorative panels, etc. They had a library collection, a rare book collection. They had a section of micrographic records, a museum collection. There's also a museum there blueprints and technical drawings, because the building there is by a famous architect, Nehemiah, so the sketches and the blueprints, and they want that to help keeping the building. So the engineers and the architects, they keep that very important. They also have the Congress, a radio collection and a TV collection. So 12 departments, 12 managers, 12 points of view. Every manager tries to say, my part of the collection is more important than yours and I'm sure you recognize it everywhere, right? So we need a structural way to build consensus towards evaluation for doing risk management, okay? So what we do with the 12 managers, so it's all consensus building and working together. It takes a little while, but it's worth it. First step, we jointly identify and define the relevant features. You can call it attributes. So it can features here, I mean, there's no specific reason for that, right? What are the features that determine the value of this heritage asset? And very important, 
We need also to quantify the importance, the relative importance between these features or weights, so I'll show you in a little bit. Take into account the organization's mandate. That's one orientation line. Because if, if there is no clear mandate or objective for the organization, then the, the value judgments can go anyway, can go different ways. So, for this particular organization, taking into account its mandate, how do we split and identify this feature? So, in consultation, so it's a long consultation pro, uh, process with the managers. For instance, there they have identified these features, what are also called the value assessment criteria, right? Historic value, social value, legal, technical, scientific, artistic, aesthetic, economic, rarity, singularity, and provenance. Once we have to identify, the next step is to define very clearly for that organization what do we mean when we say historic value. I have a perception of historic value, maybe you have a different one, different people. So it has to be very uh, clearly defined and everybody has to agree upon, okay? So when you work in that institution, historic value means the component of the heritage asset is directly associated with and contributes in a fundamental way to the understanding and appreciation of the history of the House of Representatives and of or the history of the country. So everybody agrees when we talk historic value, we're talking about this, okay? And there's a lot in the literature, like Agnes was mentioning the significance 2.0, there are different systems to address that, but we want a quantitative estimate, right? So we want to go a step forward. So after definition, we also attribute weights to this criteria, for instance. The main criteria there because it's a house of legislation, right? They make laws there. So the main criteria is legal value. Artistic value, we have, they have lots of uh, nice artwork, but for the organization mandate, the artistic value is of secondary importance in that particular context, right? So the weights here reflect the relative importance between the criteria. So legal value, according to the consultation with the managers, is 15 times more important than artistic value. So the weights reflect that difference. Once we have that, so it's a step by step. So that is said, everybody agrees, it's validated. Next step is we want to have a scale to score the degree of occurrence or intensity of each of that criteria in each component of the heritage asset. Again, in consultation with the managers, we define here a score, what for now they're calling it the intensity factor, right? So if it's a zero, the component of the heritage doesn't show that feature. For instance, if we are scoring artistic value in a, some part of the component, if it gets a score, a score of zero, it doesn't have any artistic value, okay? And we do that for every component. You see it's a difference, each step, if it's a three, it's a factor of three, three times more, okay? That's different than using a scale zero, one, two, three, four, five, which is like nominal. So here you have really a difference that we want to say, this one is three times more than this. This one is nine times more than that or three times more than this and so forth. So we go from, it doesn't show that feature, or it shows it in a very small intensity of the occurrence, is very small, small, medium, large, very large. And then here the, the Mona Lisa, no, the top ones, the occurrence of the feature is exceptional. This score indicates the maximum intensity for that particular criteria throughout all components of the heritage asset. Okay, so something that for that organization has like a maximum historic value compared to everything else will have a score here. And the other components are scored in relation to that one. So when we agree on the scale, then we can start scoring the components. I'll show you here only one, the historic archives, right? And this component was subdivided in categories that were already existing in the collection. So within the historic archives, there were original documents, 
codices, maps, printed items, and microfilms. So each component is scored now for each criteria, historic value, social value, legal value, technical, scientific, using that scale, the scoring system that everyone has agreed upon. So for instance, these original documents, they score very high on historic and social, medium for legal, no artistic value, and so forth, okay? And then what we do after scoring, I mean, I think there were 200 plus components. We do what's called here weighted sum, which is we make the product between the score and the weight of each uh, criteria. For instance, five times 243, 10 times 243. And then we add up, we add these products. So we end up with one indicator, right? That's one quantitative indicator there that reflects the relative importance of this component in relation to the rest of the heritage asset. And then we, we normalize it. So we just divide all of them by the smallest one to work with smaller numbers. And then we communicate that. So this is the same result from here shown in a graphic form, which is much easier after going through everything. Right? So here we have the administrative archives, all the red bars here, they are components or subcomponents of this guy. The blue ones are the audiovisual archives, yellow ones, historic archives, legislative archives, and so forth. So we have the components here discriminated by color. And this is this number here on the vertical axis is this one. So that we can compare now the relative importance of each component in relation to the others, right? Obviously, the legislative archives scored the highest because it's at the core of the mandate of that institution. Historic archives, important. Micrographic records, they had some unique documents that were, they had legal value and they were only on micrographics. So very important. You see the museum? If it were a museum, maybe these guys would score much higher. But it's not a museum, right? They integrate the library, use collection, the rare books in between. So now we can clearly compare the relative importance between the different items. If some kind of hazard would affect here, the impact, the loss of value to this organization will be much higher, about, this is 250, this is 50, so it will be five times higher an impact of some risk affecting these archives in comparison to, for instance, these archives. Okay? And then we can group. So this is by existing categories. We can make now value categories, which is the same. We just take the top ones, be it legislative archives or micrography records. Now we forget about which sector they come from. We just say, these are the top, most valuable parts of the collection. Can be legislative, can be micrographs, and so So we make these value categories. And we use that when we assess the risks, okay? From here, we can build the, this what we're calling the value pie, which is a pie chart that shows how much of the total value of the heritage asset uh, each component represents. So if you go back to the A category, B category in terms of relative importance, we see here category A represents about 44% of the entire value of that heritage asset. And then if somebody says, no, but uh, my museum piece is very important, but then you just, we walk back and say, we agree on the criteria, we agree on the score, we agree on the the weights, so it's all documented and uh, agreed upon. So this reflects a common understanding. If there are disagreements, you can note, and then you see if, how you proceed. But normally, uh, when it's validated, it's okay. So category B represents about 28%. Now it's not quantity, it's, um, it's importance, significance, or value. So this is a, a value pie, it's a one way of communicating how the overall value is distributed. And value pie can be used in different ways. So just a few examples. 
You can use to model, for instance, if you are working in a historic house with collection. So we can do a first level building and movable. And then within building, you can split up in components like the authentic finish, facade, brick wall. So each, each situation will be different. So these components, they are identified together with the managers, with the people, and, and with stakeholders, if it's appropriate. And then the collection items can be subdivided into different ones. We can use the value pie, for instance, to have value categories for different subcomponents. This is a historic house in, in Brazil with different components, museum, archives, two types, a library, a historic building, and a garden. So for each one of these subcomponents, we can build a value pie with different value categories, just the way we built in, in, uh, in the House of Representatives. You can also use that to capture the ensemble value. So, the, the, for instance, this, this part is ensemble here of, to capture the atmosphere, you know, the, the value of the parts together as one, as a whole. Right? So you can have one, just one slice of the pie here that has to do with the ensemble. So you can have the individual components, the objects and parts of the building. And you can also add in one part of the value pie which is, reflects the ensemble value, which is very important in, in some cases. And you can even go further and use a value pie to show the spatial distribution of the value. Like going back to Ecuador, um, how is the overall value of all movable collections distributed in the country? So we can do this type of valuation and show in the different provinces, Carchi, Esmeraldas, how much of the total value of that collection, the population of uh, movable heritage is distributed by province, which is sometimes interesting for making priorities. Okay? Just coming back to the first statement, because we, why do we do that? It's not an end in itself. We want to do this value assessment to be able to assess risks and to be able to determine which options are best. So that's the aim of risk management. It's not only making value assessment, or not only assessing risk, we want to improve the decisions concerning the long-term use and preservation of our heritage. So how do we use that to improve decisions? One aspect is that we use this quantitative indicator I mentioned before, you know, the expected fractional loss of value in the heritage asset. We use that to prioritize risks. That's the main, it's the main indicator we use to prioritize risk to cultural heritage. In other words, for this, for instance, we have a risk of fire in a building. How much am I losing of the collection and the building in a certain amount of time? What's the expected fractional loss of value to that heritage asset? So just to illustrate, these are the, the uh, scores for magnitude of risks using what we call the ABC scales that were developed at CCI and improved throughout this collaboration with the ICROM and the, the Netherlands Agents for Cultural Heritage. We have categories of risk priority from catastrophic to extreme, to high, to medium, and low, right? The numbers there, magnitude 15, which is the maximum we can catch with that scale, means we lose 100% of the collection in one year. That's the expected fractional loss of value. 100% loss in a year. So this is the maximum risk we, we can capture. Never seen it, luckily. But then if you move down, for instance, the risk score 14 means we are losing the equivalent of 10% of the value of the collection each year. Do we accept that? Coming down 13, we lose 10% of the, the value of this heritage asset each 10 years. And then we, as we come down, so 1% per 10 years. So this is the indicator I mentioned, the expected fractional loss of value. How much are we losing of the value of our heritage asset per year or in a certain amount of time? This is the main criteria we use to prioritize the risks. 
Remember that we need the quantitative indicator. So this is what we are using. Expected, how much do we expect to lose per year or in a certain amount of time of the value of that heritage asset, right? So this is priority, prioritizing risk, and then kind of just to give you an idea of, of final results when we say, okay, we, uh, we understand the risks, we know the priorities, how do we improve the decision, right? This is again one uh, example just from Ecuador, after assessing the risk to that population of movable heritage. We also, we thought of options, of measures to lower the risk, to reduce the risks, and then we look at the cost effectivity. Effectivity, yeah, this is the last one. So just to show you, we use the, how much we can uh, reduce from the expected fractional loss of value for a certain amount of money, okay? So if I invest, for instance, here $10,000 a year, how much do I preserve a safeguard from that fraction that was going to be lost if I did nothing? And here you have the numbers here, they show different options. I mean, like reinforce the buildings against uh, earthquake, move the collections to areas that are not prone to tsunami. So there are many options here. And you can see the difference. I mean, these are much more effective. For the same amount of money, we are preserving a larger part of the value of the collection if you compare to these ones. And we've seen over and over and over, many institutions, they work here. They are happy implementing measures that feel good, but not necessarily are the most effective. So risk management helps us improve this kind of decision. And just to conclude, I want to leave you with this quote. This is from um, a meeting we had in Bogota, in Colombia, in two years ago, sponsored by Iber Museos. And uh, it, has to, it had to do with everything about value, from psychological to social to risk management. It's available online, and I think that fits well with the with what we are discussing here, this quote there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Question.